The topic of my talk today is positive attitude for a healthy mind. Before we start talking about attitude, I believe all of us must understand and realize the need of a healthy mind. We talk about healthy mind as Mukesh Pai just did and we listened. But do we really believe that a healthy mind is more important than a healthy body? Unless we believe that the health of the mind is more important than the health of the body, nothing that I say will affect. It's very important. Secondly, when we look around in the world, if there are doctors present in this, please take it in a lighter vein. <laughs> when we look around in this world, we find out, some people tell me, that if you wake up in the morning from the right side of the bed and you're feeling perfectly fine, you're fresh, and there is nothing wrong with you, just go and visit your nearest doctor. <laughs> he will make sure that he finds there are 10 things wrong with you. <laughs> Medical science has advanced so much, not the fault of the doctor. Medical science has advanced so much that the doctor will tell you that your blood count is low, Sugar is a bit high, the good cholesterol is bad, the bad is even worse. <laughs> then they'll continue to tell you that your bilirubin is off color. You say, Doc, I can't see it, then you're colorblind. <laughs> Ultimately, the doctor says that you say, Doc, I feel really fine, I feel fresh. It's an illusion. <laughs> Wait. In about five years time, you'll be inflicted with such a disease. You'll say, Doc, in five years time, I'll be inflicted with such a disease. What did I do wrong? He said, you did nothing wrong. You just had the wrong grandparents. It's genetic disorder. <laughs> <laughs> what can you do, Mukesh Bhai, when you are not responsible for selecting your grandparents, what can you do with a disease like that, except change your attitude? <laughs> There are things you can't change, but there are things you can change. But I want to ask you that we do believe, we do believe that the health of the mind is important, but we don't have that focus. Because you look at the medical world, you'll have medicine for the body, creams, you have a whole system, diet for the body, workouts, gyms, walks, everything. Who ever thought of taking your mind to a walk? We are thinkers, you know, these are supposed to be the thinkers of Ahmedabad who believe in spiritual wisdom. Have we designed a system that constantly evaluates, monitors, and constantly nourishes the mind? If we haven't done it, that means our focus is not on the mind at all. It's a concept which one we don't really believe in. Go a step further. Look at the world that we've created. I was just doing a simple analysis and I found out that there are more than 50 professions in medicine. More than 50 professions in medicine that just deal with the body. Cardiology, neurology, nephrology, and endocrinology. Then you know, you get all sorts of people. There are more than 50 professions that deal with the body and for the mind, we have a poor psychology and psychiatry. <laughs> that means ours is a society that really doesn't believe, I'm sorry, you selected a good topic, but ours is a society that really doesn't believe that a healthy mind is more important than a healthy body. Once we start believing and really accepting that the health of the mind is as important as the health of the body, we'll see a simple change. But that's not your fault or my fault or anybody's fault. We cannot blame anybody. Remember, we are talking about attitude. <laughs> we cannot blame anybody and don't delve into self-pity. But the reason is very simple, because the body is visible and physical. The mind is invisible and subtle. But I've come here to tell you that sometimes in life, things invisible are more important than things visible. 
Sometimes in life, things invisible are more important than things visible. And you are witness. We see a beautiful building and we can't see the foundations which are invisible. But the building stands because of the foundation. We constantly eat and drink. Food is important. Water is more important. But we can't see air. Invisible air is more important than the visible food or water. We can go ahead and we find out that we can see planets, the earth, the solar system, galaxies. But we can't see the force of gravity that keeps everything in order. Sometimes in life, things invisible are more important than things visible. Go a step ahead, we can see this wonderful, beautiful creation. And don't worry about it if you can't see the creator because invisible things are more important than things visible. Don't insist on making God visible. Accept him. As you move ahead, you'll find out that even, now this is a big challenge for thinkers as well. I'm not just trying to protect religion or spirituality or the mind. By saying because it's invisible, still accept it, I want to challenge and let you know that even the world of science, think again, even the world of science is founded on concepts which are invisible. Think about it. The buildings stand erect. Bridges are stable. Aeroplanes and rockets fly. Because you will tell me because of aeronautical engineers, structural engineers, and civil engineers. They stand because of the calculations which are made by structure, aeronautical, and civil engineers. Calculations are made in numbers, mathematics. Now I ask you, the foundation of mathematics is one to nine and zero numbers, and the symbols of plus, minus, divide, multiplication, square root, whatever. Now I ask you, what are numbers? Has anybody seen one? Has anybody seen three? Who has seen nine? And who has seen hundred? <laughs> we haven't seen numbers. Numbers are concepts in your mind. Who has seen plus? Find me one guy, even Einstein, if he had seen divide or square root. They are all concepts which are invisible, but because science accepts these invisible concepts, the buildings stand, the bridges are stable, and aeroplanes fly. Even science is founded on concepts invisible. Then why should we complain when the world of the mind is founded on concepts invisible? The world of the mind, the health of the mind, is dependent on the concepts which are totally invisible because they are the concepts of emotions. Love, fear, sorrow, joy. Nobody sees love, fear, nobody. But you can feel them. Secondly, the world of the mind is founded on concepts of values like truth. Did Gandhi see truth in physical form? But let me tell you, just as emotions are invisible, they have the power to drive your mind. Just as values are in invisible, they have the power to drive humanity. And similarly, the concepts of philosophy and faith, spirituality are invisible, but they have the power to chart the destiny of the entire mankind. They may be invisible, but sometimes in life, invisible things are more important for th than things visible. I just want to ask you that if we believe that this invisible force of the mind, the health of the mind is very important, but the problem is modern science is just beginning to scratch, just beginning to scratch the surface of the mind. Don't be fooled by all these researches coming in and you feel, oh, we've penetrated so deep. No, 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 no. It's just modern science of Western world in just last hundred years that this whole idea of psychology and psychiatry was invented. 
And when it was invented, even now, some of the best psychiatrists say that when we talk about the mind, when we talk about the mind, they say it is like a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that isn't there. <laughs> he said, we try and search the innards of the mind and we find out that you're looking for something you don't know. You're a blind man looking for things which are totally invisible, very difficult. And that's why I feel Indian wisdom is miles ahead. Around 5,000 years ago, our saints and seers in the Vedas, the Upanishads, in Taitariya Upanishad, and in the great writings of our great historians, it is clearly explained what the mind is. The Western world is just beginning to scratch. If there is any person or any culture that could become the, let's say, the forerunner, the champion of the world of the mind and spirituality, it is India. Because we have not only analyzed the mind, we have said, oh, you talk about the mind? The rishis say, I'll describe the four functions of the mind. Forget about giving just names or titles. They say the mind operates in four ways. Very important, they say man, buddhi, chit, and ahankar. These are the four functions of the mind to keep the mind healthy. Man, buddhi, chit, ahankar, they say, what does it do? Man does sankalp. The mind constantly, the function of the mind that does the thinking and inspiration is known as the man. Buddhi is not just intellect. Buddhi, see, if you are passing by a bazaar and you are hungry, and suddenly you feel, I don't have money and I want to steal that banana, the mind will think, and you have the freedom to think, not the freedom to steal. <laughs> the mind will think that, okay, I'll take that banana, I'll do this, 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 but the buddhi stops it. Buddhi sees that there are 100 thoughts the mind thinks. The buddhi has the power and the stamina to select and discriminate the right thoughts. That is buddhi. You know, a guy who just picks out all the thoughts that he gets, we say, can a buddhi nati. Wisdom lies on what not to say, that's more important than what to say. So ultimately, the man thinks, buddhi, it selects, discriminates, right from the wrong, the low from the bad. So the buddhi tells you, no, 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 you can't steal, this is a bazaar, 20 people are looking for you, don't steal. The mind goes, no, let me, don't, let me steal, please, I'm hungry. He said, no, nope, don't. You know, this is the buddhi. Then the third function, after the buddhi decides, okay, okay you can steal. Because we have buddhis like that as well. <laughs> and the buddhi decides, okay, you can steal. Then the chit does chint one. Steal, 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 steal. You know, by inserting this idea of trillionaires, I think you've done a big disservice. <laughs> because there are guys who can reach billion, but you've made them unhappy. <laughs> but ultimately, if the buddhi goes, then the chit does chint one. And it does contemplation and visualization. How do I do it? This is the way, this is what, that's the third function. And the fourth is ahankar. When you have finished with inspiration, when you finished with selection, when you finished with contemplation, and then the ahankar says, okay, I will do it. That is identification. These four simple functions of the mind have been clearly charted out in our scriptures and the Western world is still struggling like a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that isn't there. So ultimately the depth of our vision, the depth of our inspiration and the Indian philosophical and spiritual knowledge goes far, far beyond. So I want to tell you that if through the whole process, the mind is responsible for creating an attitude. And the mind is also responsible for creating your identity. I feel identity is even more important than attitude. Attitude is good. But constant thinking results in attitude. And years of attitude results in an identity. The mind is more important, the health of the mind is more important because it determines the health of your identity. And what better example can I give than this spiritual knowledge is given to us by not great seers or sadhus or you know saints, 
but this beautiful knowledge is imparted to us by one of the greatest comedians the world has ever seen, Sir Charles Chaplin. It so happened that he was living in Switzerland most of his time, one of the greatest directors of silent films, a big comic. He was passing through some European company, country, and there he read a board which said, look alike Charlie Chaplin competition. You know, so about maybe 400 or 500 people had dressed up like Charlie Chaplin, they wanted to look alike. They, you know, it's a big competition, like you have look alike Sachin Tendulkar or Michael Jackson, it's a competition. And trust Charlie Chaplin to participate. <laughs> he decided to participate in this look alike Charlie Chaplin competition, and when he participated, to his shock and horror, he came number seventh. <laughs> <laughs> to his shock and horror, he came number seventh, but only shock and horror can allow you to gain some insight into spiritual knowledge as well. Charlie Chaplin writes in one of his memoirs, he writes, that when I came number seventh, I was so surprised, you know. Then he writes that we live in a world where showmen succeed and real men fail. <laughs> we live in a world where showmen succeed and real men fail. For a moment, even I got confused whether I was the char real Charlie Chaplin or the six before me. <laughs> they were so real, he said, okay? Even I got confused whether I was Charlie Chaplin or the six before me. Then I realized, though they could match my looks and my moves, none of them could match my mind and my attitude. Etamari maliki nusha. Your mind and your attitude is your personal belonging. He said, though they could match my looks and my moves, none of them could match my mind and my attitude. I could laugh at life. Then he writes, I loved losing more than the winner enjoyed winning because I am the real Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> See, you can also love to lose when you know that your identity is clear. He wasn't worried, he wasn't threatened. He knew that this was the way. Then he writes, more than my appearance or my action, my mind and my attitudes give me identity. So the health of your mind, coming back to the topic, the health of the mind is so important because the health of the mind will give you the health of your identity. Unless you have a healthy mind, you will never have a healthy identity. And this is more important because I leave you as judges. You decide whether you agree with me or not. Just as Mukesh Pai said earlier, very clearly, that more important than education, more important than position, and more important than wealth, or any achievement, any achievement you can make in this whole world, the health and the stability of your mind is more, more, more important. I'll give you an example, very simple. Just suppose, imagine that you are not well and you complain about chest pains. And then you come to me and say, Swamiji, can you show me the best and the most trusted cardiothoracic doctor? I need to talk to him. I need to visit him. Think about it seriously. Then I said, who do you want? He said, I want the trusted, the best in name, and the person who is successful, I said, sure, sure. Obviously, I'm going to look for a special surgeon who has probably treated maybe all the heads of states in the world. You want the most trusted? Okay, money is no problem, fine. So you have a doctor who has degrees stuck on his wall. So many N numbers of degrees. Not only that, he has operated on maybe 40 different heads of the state. So you have photographs. So you have degrees, you have awards, you have photographs. And not only that, you have opinions of the patients who say and vouchsafe that he is the best cardiothoracic surgeon in the world. You'll agree? Fine. Once while you are being wheeled into the operating theater because of your chest pain and you know this doctor is going to operate, if the nurses just tell you that, uh, sir, you know, yesterday the doctor had a huge shock. His only son died. He's suffering from instable mind. Would you operate? <laughs> now tell me, those degrees are still there? 
the wall is still filled with the pictures. The opinions don't change because he did operate on them, but will you get operated by him if he has an unstable mind? What is more important, your degrees, education, experience, or a stability of your mind? Then for God's sake, focus on it. If we believe that the stability of the mind is more important, go a step further. Yogiji Maharaj, the guru of Pramukh Swami Maharaj was in Africa, and they went to a huge house, a multimillionaire person whose house had maybe 25 to 30 rooms. Yogiji Maharaj, you know, sanctified every room with petals and your special holy water. Once when he came down into the last room, in the last room there was a cage. And on inside that cage, there was a young boy who was on all fours, frothing from the mouth, getting angry, holding the bars of the cage and shaking it. Yogiji Maharaj was shocked and he asked the owner of the home, he said, uh, uh, why is this cage there? He said, uh, let it be there. Yogiji Maharaj said, no, 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 but why, why is Swami, this is my only son. He said, but why is he in a cage? He said, he has lost the stability of his mind. If he's outside, he bites us and hurts us. Then Yogiji Maharaj said, but he's your only son. He said, I know he's my only son, but he doesn't know that he's my only son. Then Yogiji Maharaj said that all the wealth of this home, perhaps the servants are enjoying more than the only son and inheritor of the home. Stability of mind is more important than education, is more important than wealth, and is more important than position. When we were in England, we knew Margaret Thatcher, the Prime Minister of England, she was considered as the Iron Lady. For 10 years, she ruled England. She set out policies for conservative. Don't think I'm conservative. <laughs> but she set out policies for conservative government. And what happened at that time? When she dictated, Europe took notes. Now it's the other way around. Europe took notes when Margaret Thatcher, Maggie Thatcher, she dictated. Such was the power. She was known as the Iron Lady. You know what has become of her now? She's suffering from Parkinson's disease. She doesn't know what she says. The government has to set up a system to protect her privacy from the media. She doesn't meet anybody. Even if she meets, she cannot relate. I want to ask you, even the prime minister is nobody if you lose the stability of your mind. Nothing is more important in this world than the health of your mind. If you understand, then the part that I want to really open up the mind and serve what is so important. Only then, otherwise we'll have great quotations, great thoughts, and great clatter. But think about it seriously. Believe that the stability of the mind is the most important. I'll go up a step further. Perhaps the most material country in this world, perhaps I've said, pure British way, so you can't catch me. British people always talk about apparent, perhaps, maybe, Somehow, sometime, <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> Nothing really happens, you know, but still I'm just trying to tell you, this is, this is the way, but I'm telling you that perhaps the most materialistic country in the world is America. And we must, whether we like it or dislike it, we must also accept perhaps the most powerful country in the world is America. And so the most powerful person in the world should be the American president. Bush has proved enough. The most powerful would be the American president, okay? Now think, it is only in the charter of the American government that they've put an insanity clause. You'll be surprised. They have put an insanity clause that the president, who's the most powerful person in the whole world, if at any time, the vice president and cabinet can prove that he is insane or he has lost his emotional stability, by default, the president would be removed. I think India should learn as well. <laughs> it's important. The stability of the mind, the stability of the mind is the most powerful quality. If the most powerful nation of the world and the most powerful person of the world and the most powerful quality 
of that person is stability of mind and emotional stability, I think when India has so much wealth of this knowledge on this side, we should understand that the stability of the mind and emotions are going to be very important as we move ahead in life. And that is why our scriptures have said, Jitam Jagat Kena Mano Hiena. Even after becoming the president of America and ruling the world, you still have to make a stable mind. Why don't we start doing it in our own homes? <laughs> if that is still to be achieved, our scriptures have said, Jitam Jagat Kena Mano Hiena. Then again, Plato has said, self conquest is the greatest of all conquests. And to repeat the words of Mukesh Pai, he said, Victor Hugo had said, that bring on all the armies of the world, bring on all the armies of the world, attitude of a single man is more powerful than all the armies of the world. If you have the right attitude, you become more powerful. Coming back to the attitude of a single person becoming more powerful than all the armies of the world, in the Second World War, in the Second World War when Hitler, he had won the whole of Europe, Britain was no longer a challenge if you won Europe. If some country has won India, Sri Lanka is no challenge. I'm just giving you a simple comparison. So when Hitler, after four years of war, had won the whole of Europe, England and Hitler also made a statement, soon in a week's time, Britain will have her neck ringed like a chicken. These were the words of Hitler. Very clearly, because he could manage, he could manipulate, he could send threats, he could even revise the predictions of Nostradamus. This is, this is what he did, you know, everything to make sure that Hitler, his machinery won. When the Germans sent all their bombers, the Beatles, and when 80% of England or London was a fire, burning, people were helter-skelter, we say that England won the Second World War not because they had better armies, better armaments, or because they were hard fighting. It was because of Churchill's single man's attitude, he gave the symbol V for victory, not after India won the 2020. <laughs> he gave this symbol when 80% of London was burning and he said, V for victory. We will fight in the air, we'll fight in the seas, we'll fight on land, we'll fight with our spirit, Toil, sweat, blood, and tears will fight till we live, but England shall will is because of one man's attitude that the Second World War was won. Attitude is bigger than all the armies of the world put together. And again, do you think it was just non-violence that drove the British away from India? It was the attitude of Mahatma Gandhi, not just non-violence. Mahatma Gandhi, you know why he was powerful? He decided that I'll just live in these threadbare clothes. Bring me one man. Even now, even philosophers who believe in Gandhi are ready to live a life that he did. One man's attitude could win the war. One man's attitude could push away the empire. It's very important that if we try and develop the attitude, the whole nation casts an attitude around a powerful man's attitude. But then you'll tell me, Swami, how does this affect me? Well, it does. Our scriptures have said that mana eva manushyanam karanam bandha moksha yoho. The attitude of the mind. Our scriptures have clearly said the attitude of the human mind, it decides whether you are bound or you are set free. Your mind can create limitations for you and your mind can break those limitations. This is the secret that our scriptures have given us. We can custom design, in this age of custom designing, we can custom design the environment that we want to live in. You know, as you see the world as it moves in, we'll custom design things. Just as when Duryodhan was asked in Mahabharat, that what is the world like? And Duryodhan said, there is not a single good soul in this world. Because he was bad. And when Yudhisthir was asked the same question, what is this world like? And Yudhisthir said, there is not a single bad soul in the world because Yudhisthir was good. So don't you complain to me that others are bad. I will decide that you are bad. It's very important 
forget about complaining, try and accommodate and adjust and create a world that you can progress in. Once in a train, when a rich man and his wife, they entered a compartment, and there are other passengers sitting in the train, and this lady, she was rich, and rich have this habit of letting people know they are rich. Not just by their garments, but by also their attitude. She came into the compartment, she started complaining, the light is not right, the curtains are not good, the seat is stinking. And then ultimately, after she was exhausted from the inside of the compartment, she took on the nature. Oh, the sun is not shining, the clouds are too thick. She can't do anything about it. <laughs> you know? Oh, there are no birds in the fields, look at them, how dirty. She kept on, on and on and on. Just to bring a change to the environment, the passenger opposite, he asked, okay, let me try and just bring a change. He asked the man, the rich man, he said, sir, you know, uh, may I know what do you do? And the man said, you know, we are both in the manufacturing industry, me and my wife. He said, what do you manufacture? Soap. He said, what about your wife? Ah, okay, she manufactures her own unhappiness. <laughs> you understand that you have the ability to set up industries and industries, okay? And you can continue to manufacture your own unhappiness so far as if you are not aware. So ultimately, if you create an attitude around you, it is going to affect. A step further than that, the attitude and the fears and emotions can affect your body. One experiment which I've read in a scientific journal, they took a, a prisoner voluntarily and they were experimenting on him because he was sentenced to death. They put him in a room, they first searched what is his fear in his mind. He hated snakes. And they put him in a dark room and then just created sounds of snakes. And slowly, slowly, as if a black cobra is coming by and that said that your death penalty is to be done by a cobra biting you. He was, he was resigned to it anyway. Slowly, the sounds and everything, there was no real snake. And after the sounds and feel and everything, they took two pins and just pricked his forefinger twice, as if the snake has bitten him. This man went into such a shock because his mind created everything. He could feel the snake, he could think of the snake, he could feel it approaching, he could feel the sound, and when his forefinger was bitten, he died. But you know what happened? When did they did the post-mortem, they found out that when a real snake bites you, and the venom which creates the toxins in your body, the same toxins were by created by his body inside his own body. Your mind is not just limited to a simple attitude of manufacturing unhappiness. It can go further and further, which can also create such miseries for your body as well. Dr. Bernie Siegel, he writes very clearly that I started thinking he's an oncologist. And he says that when I was passing through my hospital, cancer, I ticked off certain patients who were supposed to die in a week. And certain patients who I will treat in a month. I got shocked when I found out that the patients who were supposed to die started living. And the patients who were supposed to live started dying. He said there is something more than the medicine I'm giving them which is affecting them. And then he writes, the biggest thing I learned from my patient is never to use the word terminal patient. Nobody is destined to die. There is no such disease that can always make sure that you die. He said, I have come to a conclusion that there are only two types of patients, those who wish to live and those who wish to die. Yad Rakhjo? It's a very critical thing that your attitude does not just affect the way you live, it also affects the way you die. It covers the entire spectrum, and that is why even the modern science and the future is slowly shifting focus towards the health of the mind. WHO, World Health Organization, has published a recent report, but it's not such a nice report to talk about. They say by 2020, depression will be the single most biggest disease of our whole humanity. Now I ask the doctors, how many fields will you create? Because that will also give you money. <laughs> Treating so many people. 
depression will become the health of the mind will become the greatest concern for the future of mankind then in that report they write they say that suicide is a tragic problem every year 1 million to 1.5 million people commit suicide still listen then they write worldwide more people die from suicide more people die from suicide than all the homicides terror attacks and wars put together you are trying to spend so much energies on stopping terror so much you can see the budgets of all the world in trying to stop wars and on one end we have people who are perfectly safe and happy so called and they commit suicide the third figure that they brought out which is more shocking that 1 million succeed while 20 million attempt let this figure sink in your mind if 20 million now don't think it's a distant thing till now we were thinking that bombs were only things that went into went off in palestine now amdabad akshardham you know we know that everything is at our doorstep all these things if we feel that no 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 our children our people will never think of this don't be too sure because as we move ahead that this is the thing that the world is moving to but at the same time i also want to give you the good news you might feel yes the world is moving towards that difficulty of the mind the problems of the mind the health of the mind but the good news is that one of the greatest psychologists william james of our time he has written he says that the greatest discovery of this age is that man can change his life by changing the attitude of his mind it isn't that you can't do anything about it if you so choose and if you so decide we can change this entire scenario of the world your home yourself your life and the world put together but i'll also tell you that you'll tell us swami ji you are sadhus okay maybe you also think that we have more relaxed life than you <laughs> you may be right maybe not but i'm telling you that all the sadhus who are talking to you in this whole week they have no selfish interest it is not whether you believe me or trust me or you follow me no 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 i'm asking you to follow your own mind and follow your own heart just as i had talked before that there were workout systems and exercises for the body i have come up with couple of ideas which are not read from books but something which i felt that i can share with you because also understand that nobody is an expert on anything if somebody says i am the expert be sure he is not because we love in the we live in a world where it's all consultants experts everybody creates a niche for themselves you know you get doctors who are specialists on just the right ear and not the left there are a huh? okay just the right here and not the left so i'm saying specialist consultants god just by the way i'll just share this idea with you it's nothing to do with this topic but i'm just reminded spontaneously okay we live in a world of experts but be very careful and wary what happened once in america i had read this recently that's why i'm sharing this with you once in america there was a man in a cattle farm a simple farmer he had his cattle and suddenly a suited booted executive with a briefcase proper tied everything he came in and then he said to that you know farmer he said hey how do you farmer he said yes sir what do you want he said uh, if i can tell you if i can tell you the exact number of cows and bulls you have in your farm will you give me a free calf the farmer said uh, he said if i can tell you the exact numbers of cows and bulls you have and the milk that you produce will you give me a calf for free the farmer said uh, okay this man he opened up his laptop we live in a world of experts he opened up his laptop then connected it with the satellite fed in information somewhere in germany it tuned up to the satellite the satellite stopped took the picture of that farm analyzed the dots through those dots the computer analyzed that this fat dot and this thin dot it all made sense that this many number of cows this many number of bulls within about 1 hour a 1000 page report came out from his printer 
you know, this may happen to you as well, listen carefully. A thousand page report came out and suddenly that man, he went to that farmer and he said, hey, look, in this farm you have 554 cattle. 300 are bulls, 254 are cows. Right or wrong? He said, right. And you produce about 4,000 liters of milk every day. Right or wrong? He said, right. He said, I told you, now give me a calf. This farmer then told him, he said, if I can tell you who you are, will you give my calf back? <laughs> and that man said, okay, you tell me that you are the representative of the local political party. <laughs> this man said, how did you know? He said, because firstly, you asked a question which I did not ask. <laughs> you raised a question which I did not ask. Santiti <laughs> Samajjo. You raised a question which I did not ask. You asked a question which I did not have. I already knew. You gave me an answer which I already knew. <laughs> you asked a question which I did not ask. You gave me an answer which I already knew. And you want to get paid about it. Okay? And you don't know a damn thing about calves because give me my dog back. <laughs> this man <laughs> had given a dog to this expert who didn't even know what a cow is. You will get experts like this. If somebody tells you in this world, that he's an expert, be careful. <laughs> Nothing for any consultant, don't worry. <laughs> because you have your job. But I'm just trying to say here that I am no expert on attitudes. Mukesh Bhai lovingly, constantly gives me just one topic, attitude. <laughs> that is his love for me. But I am no expert. So, but I have thought of a couple of things which can help you practically when you go home. Yes, we want to take care of our health of the mind. We want to take care of the health of the identity. We want to be positive in our lives. What should we do? Simple logic is, when you go to a normal doctor for the body, apart from medicine, now he also prescribes a diet. And then he'll say, okay, okay. you said, doc, I eat every day anyway. He said, you eat, but eat different. <laughs> then the doctor will tell you, okay, you walk twice a day. He said, but doc, I walk every day. I've been walking since I was born. He said, you walk, but walk different. You know, walk briskly, 20 minutes at a time, not walk just loitering around. Yes, we've been walking all our life, but walk different. Tomorrow, I believe, Adhyatman Swami will be telling you, you breathe. Yes, we've been breathing since we were born, but breathe different. <laughs> <laughs> because it's the same things that you are doing. Just do them differently. Today I've come to tell you, since you were born and till you die, you are going to think, but think different. That is going to bring a change in the world you live in. Walk, but walk different. Eat, but eat different. Breathe, but breathe different. Think, but think different. Because attitudes are the products of your thought. And if you change the way you think, you'll be able to change the attitudes that you have. How, you'll tell me. Even some of these people in the audience, you know, some will argue. He says, Swamiji, look, I will decide when I need to think different. Such people are necessary. You know, they're very important. And they also form, because God has no challenge. We need guys to challenge God as well. But ultimately, he'll say, no, no, Swami, I live in a free world. Don't force me. Let me decide to think in my own way. I'll decide, I'll choose when to change. Don't force me. This is a free world. But then again, I'm asking, think different. I'm just giving you a thought. If you like it, accept it. If you don't, dump it. I'm asking you that we live in a free world, correct? Yes or no? We live in a free world? OK. Now, why are you so careful? Don't, I'm not going to, uh, this is not an exam. We live in a free world. It's a democratic world, OK? But if we live in a free world and we are free to choose anything and everything. But I want to remind you, some of the closest things to your life, you have not been able to choose. Yes, you can choose the size of your shoe. Yes, you can choose the color of your shirt. 
But that doesn't matter. Some of the closest things in your life and which are close to your heart, you have no choice whatsoever. You have accepted. First, what about your birth date? Did you choose your birth date? You celebrate it every year, but did you choose it? <laughs> You've accepted it and you are celebrating it. Did you choose your name? Sunil Bhai. But I know you love it. You have no choice. You didn't choose the closest things to your life. You didn't choose your birth date. You didn't choose your name. Did you choose your parents? Did your parents choose you? I think they didn't have a choice. <laughs> you didn't choose your parents. Your parents didn't choose you. Did you choose your brothers or sisters? No. Most of our problems arise from our family, brothers, sisters, and relatives. Have you chosen them? We can't even choose our neighbors. India hasn't chosen Pakistan. <laughs> we can't choose our neighbors, I'm trying to tell you. If you buy a house in a good locality, anybody can become your neighbor. We can't even choose our neighbors. Go a step ahead. We cannot even choose the color of our skin. Some people are unhappy with their height. They feel 5'5 five five is not fine, but you are accepting it and moving ahead. We can't even choose diseases. If you think I create them, you can't choose. If doctors feel they can cure disease, then no eye surgeon should have glasses. I have seen most wearing glasses. <laughs> Gastroenterologists should not have acidity. Cardiothoracic surgeons should not need a bypass. If doctors can cure and we could cho choose disease, we can't even choose disease. Some of the closest things that dictate the joy and sorrow of our life, we have no choice whatsoever. Go a step ahead, we cannot even choose the intellect. We cannot choose the mind. And we cannot even choose the country we are born in. Suppose the US soldier who is fighting in Iraq or in Afghanistan Suppose the US soldier who is fighting in Afghanistan, hating the Afghans, he dies. He dies hating the Afghans. And by law of reincarnation, if he's born in Afghanistan, he begins his day hating US. <laughs> what a world. I, I'm just trying to tell you. What a world. Go home and think of certain things later on. <laughs> it will still affect you. What a world. I'm just trying to say there are so many things we can't choose and we still say we live in a free world. There is only one thing that we can choose which Mukesh Pai outlined is the way we look at the world. You have no choice over your brothers and family members, your systems, the way you live, some of the, but the way you look at that life. The attitude you form because of that life and if you feel Bruce Lee felt that his one foot short was shorter by half an inch, he didn't complain. He utilizes to become, become one of the best Kung Fu experts in the whole world. So ultimately, if you can choose the attitude right, you can program yourself and you can become much, much stronger. So you can program the weather of your mind. You'll be able to control the atmosphere of your home. And you'll be in charge of the environment of your world around you. Try and program the weather of your mind. Go home and be a little different. So the three steps, very quickly, I want to put forward before you. That first is to empty your mind. For a positive attitude and a healthy attitude and a healthy mind, empty your mind. It's a big struggle, huh? Even I tell you that you throw away the old things from your home, you'll create a bundle, then your wife says, but we do need them at all, so you'll put them back. <laughs> you try it this time, don't tell them I said it. But you go home and try it, you said, I don't need this, I don't need this, I don't need this, and suddenly you feel, oh, I need all of them. It's so difficult to even get rid of things which really remain as obstacles in our house. We can't even empty our homes. What about emptying our mind? If you can empty your mind of negative emotions, you'll have such a different world. One example which is very close at my heart, and that example is of a little boy, he comes home, <laughs> And he tells his mom and dad that, you know, I have been selected in the annual celebration of the school. The parents said, yeah, but what do you have to do? He said, I have to go to practice every evening, 4 o'clock. Then you pick me up at 5. There's a one-hour practice. 
The parents were so happy, my child selected as one of the few in the annual day function. So they were praising him home, left, right and center. After the annual day was over, the child came running home and said, mom, mom, dad. He said, what? He said, I had a, such a great time. He said, but what did you do in the annual day? He said, you know, I had a one hour role to play, one hour. He said, what? He said, some of my friends had only role of five minutes. Some had 10 minutes. Some had 15 minutes and I had a full one hour. Mom and dad said, so what did you have to do? He said, my friend, he spoke. Another friend, he sang. Another participated in a drama. He said, what did you do? He said, my role was to sit in the audience and just clap, clap, clap. <laughs> and I had the best time of the world. Here, the child was so exuberant with joy because he felt clapping was also an important part of life. Most positive and no negative attitude. He was not in competition with anybody. He did not know the difference between the stage and the audience. He did not know the prejudice between this and that. But he became happy and happier, but his parents became miserable and miserable. <laughs> because sometimes parents need to learn more from their children. We live in a world of competition. We live in a world of proving ourselves. And the adult mind is filled with prejudice, hatred, and reservations that we cannot empty our mind of negative emotions. The child was happy. So ultimately, I'm asking you that if you can empty your mind of negative emotions, what can happen? So just as we clean our homes, we go back and clean our desks. The women in our homes, they have to clean the refrigerator every week. And you say, what's going on? You know, especially flavored chas beats the fridge. <laughs> you know, but ultimately, we need to make sure that things remain constantly clean. Then what about emptying and cleaning your mind of negative emotions? Krishna, he says, the first updesh he gives to Arjun. When Arjun tells Krishna that Siddhanti mama ghatrani mukham cha parishushyati, roma harshas cha jajayate brahmati vacha me manaha. I don't want to fight. I feel weak. My mouth is dry. My mind is spinning. I just don't want to fight. Krishna does not. He's not like the local physiotherapist. He says, okay, your hands are shaking. Okay, I'll give you a massage. Here, take a glass of water. Relax. Nothing like that. <laughs> Krishna says one most important thing. He says, Klebhyam masma gamaha partha naitretat upapadyate Shudra radeya dorbalyam tyaktva tishtha parantapha. He said, fool, get up. Get rid of the cowardice in your heart and begin to do your duty. Empty your mind from cowardice and empty your mind from negative thoughts. The biggest fear Krishna saw in Arjun, he said he has got into a negative mode. And then I'll tell you, just that the mind is so powerful in the positive mode, it is even more powerful in the negative mode. So he said, empty your mind right now. Then Arjun keeps on arguing. He keeps on arguing. Krishna says, Prajahati yada kaman sarvan partha manogatan. He said, from your mind, leave all the desires. This is true or not. Just leave everything. And he says, Atmanyava atmanah tushta stita pragnosta dochyate. If you are fulfilled, steady in your heart, in your own soul, you will be balanced. Still, Arjun keeps arguing. He said, no, 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 but I think of this, I think of that come out from this thinking process. It's a cycle, you need to come out. And he says, no, then Krishna explains, this is very important. What thinking can do, Krishna says, dhyayato vishayan punsa, sanghas te shupajayate, sanghas dhyayato vishayan punsa, sanghas te shupajayate, sanghat sanjayate kamaha, kamat krodho bhijayate. Krodhat bhavati sammoha, sammoha smruti vibrahma, smruti pranshat buddhi nasho, buddhi nashat pranashyati. Krishna says, if you keep thinking, thinking, thinking about these material problems, if you keep thinking, thinking, thinking about the things before you, you give them up. If you constantly think unguided, and you are constantly steeped in material thoughts, is from that you'll get attachment. From attachment, you will get lust. From lust, you'll end up in anger. From anger, you'll get up in confusion. 
from confusion, you'll become senseless. Without having any sense, you lose the balance of your mind. And when a person has lost the balance of his mind, there is nothing but destruction. Wrong thinking can lead straight to destruction. Krishna says, empty your mind from any wrongful thinking. If you can empty your mind, then what will happen? The ultimate things they say, that negative emotions can be eradicated in this way. How? One negative thought. If somebody has a watch, I'll need a, uh, can I just get a watch because there is not, so I need to. Saradabina. Okay. So he says that the negative emotions, even one negative emotion can destroy the whole world. How? That if you have a negative emotion, get rid of it as fast as possible. Coming back to the fridge, you need to clean it once in a seven days. If you have a dead mouse in your home, you need to get rid of it in maybe two hours. If you have stale food, maybe two days, okay? Hopefully even not one day. But ultimately, you need to remove all these negative things which are lying stale, and we never worry about old hatreds which are still stored in our mind. 10-year-old hatred is still there. 15-year-old uh, fight is still there. If you do not allow a dead mouse to remain in your home, why do you allow a 10-year-old hatred to remain in your home? Get rid of it. Once you empty your mind of all these negative emotions, you'll become a much freer person. Please listen to me. That the hatred, hatred destroys the hater more than the hated. If you have hatred for somebody, and you tell me, Swami, for the last 10 years I've been hating him, he doesn't even know who are you hurting, him or yourself. There are people when we talk to them and say, I'll never forgive this guy. I said, even after 10 years, even after 10 years, he said, but he doesn't even know that you haven't forgiven him. It's you that keep reminding him. <laughs> Ultimately, the guy who does not forgive suffers. You'll argue with me again, but he hasn't forgiven me. Why should I forgive him? You should forgive him for your own health. He should forgive you for his health. Don't think that by forgiving somebody, you are doing him a favor, you are doing yourself a favor. Forgiveness, getting rid of hatred is more important. Even things like jealousy. You know, the Pramukh Swami gives a beautiful example of the Shiv Bhakta. He goes and meditates upon Shiva. Shiva becomes pleased. And Shiva says that you have meditated for one year. Okay, I'm pleased. You ask what you want. He said, um, uh, anything I ask? He said, I'll give you three boons, wishes. You ask, and then I can give. Suddenly this man said, anything I ask? Yes, anything you ask is because of your penance. But remember, whatever you ask, your neighbor will get double. <laughs> the problems began. He went home, and uh, before he could say, the wife was very restless. He said, no, no, I'm, I've asked Shiva that we should have two homes. We should have one home. And he said, you fool, look at the neighbor. He's got two. He said, no, 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 wait a minute. He tells Shiva, Shiva, just look, I did the penance, not my wife. She might be my better half, but still, I am the guy who struggled. Let me ask. Shiva goes, okay, you think and ask. Then he thought a lot. One negative emotion like jealousy. He said, God, if you are so pleased on me, let me lose one of my eyes. <laughs> what happened to the neighbor? He said, God, if you are so pleased on me, let me lose one of my arms. Poor armless. God, if you are really pleased on me, let me lose one of my foot. Legless. Ultimately, even after doing penance, which was a good thing, even after pleasing God, which was even a better thing, even after achieving what he wanted,